And welcome day two of the Vid21 conference. My name is Julia Steele, the creator and host of what is quickly becoming my favourite thing to do in March. Although my husband reminded me yesterday that his birthday was in March, so I might have to re like rephrase my opening <laughs> to Vid from now on. So uh, welcome. Um, we are in for an absolute treat to kick us off this morning. We are joined by the wonderful Cole Fink. I've known Cole for a few years now. Um, he is an absolute legend in everything to do with tribes and community. Um, and is a cross between Yoda and the Energizer Bunny. So when you uh, get to know him in this session, you'll understand why. But he, he's, he's fantastic at combining insights with wisdom and energy and enthusiasm. And he's just great to hang out with. So he's going to take us on a really quick trip through how to build a thriving tribe and of contributors. And I know from particularly many of the conversations yesterday, that how do we bring people back together, especially after last year, is going to be so key. So welcome, um, Cole. I'm going to hand straight over to you and enjoy enjoy this. Uh, so as we get started, I would just like to uh, test, testing, testing that everything is working. So firstly, uh, if you could, I'd like to test out a digital round of applause. So the way that works is you just unmute yourself and go, yay, for like half a second and then mute yourself again. All right. And that's what I'm going to ask for at the end. Uh, so can we just try a quick digital round of applause? Everyone just unmute and go, yay, and then mute again. Ready? Go. <laughs> yay. <laughs> yay. <laughs> yay. Perfect. It's working. Uh, and the other thing is I do love a good chat box. So if you wouldn't mind, please just test out the chat box. If you could just pop in the chat box, maybe where in the world you are uh, that you're tuning in. One of the things that I have loved about the digital transformation of the last 12 months is that experiences are no longer so narrow and we get to connect with so many other people. So we're in Shanghai, Brisbane, Sydney, Wellywood. I've never heard of Wellywood. I thought that was a nickname for, for Wellington, but, but, but is it? No, Sue? Yes, it is. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and Melbourne, Sarah. Well, you're probably just down the street from me. Uh, everybody, it's an absolute honour and a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I've known Julia for a number of years and uh, amidst the chaos that was last year, the Vid19 conference was just this beacon of light and hope and, uh, and I just enjoyed every minute of it. And so I'm utterly honoured to be here playing along. And, um, and today I want to talk about engagement. Uh, so... <laughs> I describe myself as an engagement expert and a public speaking expert. And, uh, and if, if ever you want to put pressure on yourself, tell people you're a public speaking and engagement expert and then, uh, and then do speeches about it because <laughs> what then happens is, of course, they expect you to be very good at public speaking and engaging at all times. So uh, I hope that I can live up to the billing. And what we're going to talk about today is uh, how to engage a thriving tribe of contributors. So... This is a conversation about leadership. Um, it's a conversation about community and it's a conversation about making things a little easier. So when I think about leadership, I think of the, this tension that has existed in the leadership discourse for the last number of years. And it's this idea that the leader, in my opinion, has become, I don't know, this position which is so venerated, so celebrated, and so focused on that we hold the leader accountable for everything. And I think there is some truth to that. I think there is some truth to the idea that if a company is focusing on the wrong things, then the CEO is at fault. I think there's some truth to the idea, uh, fellow Australians, that if a government is focusing on the wrong things and ignoring certain people, then the prime minister is at fault. So I, I do idea that the leader is accountable and that we really do need to uh, kind of think about leadership as taking total control and ownership of everything that happens. And I think if you think about any of the greatest teams or communities that you've been involved in, the leader had almost nothing to do with what was going on. I think the most incredible communities, the most incredible tribes, the most incredible businesses, it's almost like the community itself is the leader. And to, be, to participate 
in such an environment is one of the most um, stunning, like nourishing things that humans can do, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> Sue's just made a comment in the chat box about the, the, uh, the painting behind me. So I should say, welcome everybody to my home. Uh, this is my office and this is the carefully curated area of where I live. I assure you if I was to turn the camera around, you'd see toys, you'd see chaos. There's a two-year-old in this house. You may hear him at some point in time. There's a 37-week pregnant woman <laughs> who's trying to control the two-year-old. So it, like anything could happen at this point. And uh, you can hear kookaburras, you can hear galahs. I've actually got a little galah here on my pin. So there you go. Anyway, welcome to my home and thank you for welcoming me into your home or office or uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, this presentation, it's about growing a thriving tribe of contributors. So it's a conversation about leadership, but it's a conversation about leadership that doesn't focus on the leader. <laughs> it's a conversation about leadership that focuses on the tribe. So I want to talk about leadership through a lens of not what are you going to do? I want to talk about leadership through the lens of what are they going to do and what are they going to experience? So if you wouldn't mind in the chat box, just so I have a, a sense of like who's here and who you're leading, could you describe in the chat box either your, it might be your job title, it might be the tribe of people who you lead. I'm interested in who it is that you would love to engage more deeply, who it is that you would love to see truly thriving and contributing, who is the tribe that you are the leader of that you would love to make a big impact for? Love it in the chat box. If you could just scribble down a quick note about who it is that you're leading uh, in, in your community. Who are your peeps? Project teams. Awesome. So this is a really common one. A group of people who are assembled together to get something done. So Chris is leading a, a creative community. So Chris, you're leading a group of people who are, what are they? Uh, are they creating stuff for themselves? Are they creating stuff for an organization? What's their thing? Wayne's got a corporate campus, right? Participants there, awesome. Julia is engaging everybody who's attending VID this year. Totally, that's a little tribe that she's trying to engage. Awesome, so yours are business people, Chris. Program managers in employment and community services. Okay, fantastic. Uh, diverse leadership groups, government agencies. All right, awesome. So what I love about this is that the people in those groups are kind of in, uh, in their specific areas, might share nothing in common with each other. We've got an audience here today live, and I'm sure in the recording later, who are leading groups of people that are very disparate in their kind of focus and in their goals and aspirations and everything else. But of course, the thing that binds us all together and is common to all of us is our humanity. So what we're having today is a conversation about leading humans and how do we create communities where humans thrive and really want to contribute. I reckon there's a few key challenges when it comes to growing communities, whether your community is the staff that you lead in the corporate environment, whether it's clients that you're trying to attract. Uh, you know, it could be, you could be the pastor at a church group, right? You could be the scout leader or a soccer coach. There's a community that you're leading. And I think there are challenges that are common to all of us. And I'll typically talk today uh, with a lens of you're a leader in an organization. Uh, but I don't want to stay locked in that um, orientation. So I'll use a few examples from that space, but I don't want you to feel like this is only applicable in that space. You could just be a coach of a local um, sports team and a lot of this stuff will be entirely relevant to you, even if there's no money or like uh, corporate responsibility involved. But a few of the key challenges I reckon when we're uh, trying to generate a community like this, we have the challenge of trying to attract the right people, right? So whether it's through recruitment or marketing or whatever it is, trying to get the right people who are going to really thrive in your environment is critical. Try and retain those people, right? So once someone comes along, you know, I, I imagine you've probably had an experience before. You've been really excited to start a new job or join a new organization or find a new club or group, and you're really excited to join it. And yet the enthusiasm kind of waned and it disappeared and eventually you moved on to other things. So we're trying to not just attract the right people, but retain those people. And truly what we're trying to do, I think, is get the best out of them and have them get the best out of us. Uh, I love 
what Matt Church, my, my friend and mentor, says about leadership, which is it's when the best version of you leads the best version of us. And so I'm obsessed with the idea of communities where everybody is helping each other be a better version of who they are. And particularly, the problem that I'd love to help you solve is that if leadership sometimes feels heavy for you, if leadership feels like a burden for you, if it feels like every problem that crops up and every challenge that has to be resolved and every roadblock that's in the way is the responsibility of the leader and the leader alone to solve and that you are constantly burdened with that responsibility, I would love it if over the next 30 or 40 minutes, we can share a few ideas that might crack that open for you and allow your leadership uh, to become a little lighter, a little more joyous and a little less burdensome uh, because hopefully the responsibility uh, for the, the, the health and well-being of your tribe becomes more and more distributed throughout your tribe. So this is a conversation about leadership focused on the people who you are leading. Um, let's talk about what engagement actually is. Um, I think the word engagement is used in lots of different ways. And some people use it in ways that doesn't really align with how I think about it. And I'll give you an example. If you work at Facebook, one of the number one metrics that they track is user engagement. And so what they're doing there is saying, we want to get people's eyes on our website as often as we possibly can. Now, I don't know what your opinion about Facebook is, but mine is bad and getting worse. <laughs> I feel like Facebook's goal with, with, with respect to me is simply to trap my attention in their website for as long as they possibly can so that they can extract very small amounts of value out of my attention, but which when you combine that into, you know, their billion active users or whatever it is, turns into huge amounts of money for them. And they call that engagement. And it just makes me want to puke. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sue's saying I have an allergic reaction to Facebook. Same. I don't think of Facebook as engaging. And I think if you wanted to create like a gold standard of engagement or like a, the ladder of the most engaging to least engaging things on the world, Facebook would be way down near the bottom. What Facebook is, is uh, I don't want to use the word engage there. What Facebook is doing is manipulating us. They're not engaging us. They are manipulating us. We are the product to them, not the tribe. And so I want to, I want to just frame up a, a definition of engagement for us to align around before we go any further. Because I would hate to think that we were going to have a conversation designed to manipulate people or to, to, like to use them in some way. It just gives me, ugh, it makes me feel icky. I want to I talk about engagement in a way where people are truly, you know, expanding, growing, rising, whatever it is. Um, this presentation, you'll notice, uh, is not a death by PowerPoint uh, <laughs> series of bullet points on slide decks. And it is, in fact, actually just a whole bunch of post-it notes with ideas that I've written on them. And what's cool about that is, uh, it means that we can take this presentation wherever you like. So if you have any particular questions or rabbit holes you'd like to explore, I invite you to put them in the chat box because at any point I can deviate from my original plan because I have a pen and a series of post-it notes here. We can go wherever you like. But firstly, I want to talk about what engagement feels like. Uh, in the chat box, can you tell me what's something that you're finding really engaging at the moment? What's a community or an organization or something like even a, like a pursuit of some sort. So for me at the moment, farming, I'm finding incredibly engaging. Uh, so just uh, about 12 months ago, my family and I, we bought a 27 acre property out in the hills to the east of Melbourne and we're growing ducks and we're growing chickens and we're growing sheep and we've got alpacas and we've got all these gardens outside. And um, I just am loving and deeply engaged in the process of learning about farming. So I'm interested, what are you really engaged by at the moment? In the chat box, if you wouldn't mind, can you just tell me, it doesn't have to be to do with work, it doesn't have to be serious, it doesn't have to be important. I mean, it might be, but what's something that you're really engaged in at the moment? Right, so Nosh is saying this conference has been really engaging, that's super cool. Wayne is finding parenting, right? The growth and learning of a six-year-old daughter. Uh, Wayne, I'm gonna come back to your comment because it turns out you and I are on the same wavelength here. Right, Sarah as well. Uh, Sarah, of course, being uh, working with Julia to make Vid21 this amazing event. She's finding this project particularly engaging. 
Chris is loving his photography group, sharing ideas and questions about nerdy things. Totally, Chris. Well, I could tell you all about the camera that's on the other side of this image after this call, if you like. <laughs> right, Mandy's deeply engaged in, in cooking, right? Creating healthy meals. Awesome. I love all those things. As I say, for the, at the moment for me, it's farming. That's kind of my thing that I'm, that I'm, that I'm deeply engaged in. But I reckon there's one uh, kind of model that is common to everything that's really engaging. And it looks like this. I reckon engagement is the intersection of learning and growing. I reckon we are truly engaged when we're at the intersection of learning and growth. And I invite you to just think about that thing that you just wrote down. All right, so Megan's talking about Pilates, a community that she's, uh, she's joined during COVID and the university community, graduate diploma of psychology. That's awesome, All right? And we talk about Chris's photography group or Sarah running the Vid21 conference, okay? I reckon, does it feel true to you as it does to me that there's this combination of learning going on? So you're learning new things and there's this element of personal growth. You are growing in some way. And the way I came to this was through my own personal experience. I thought of the various different things that have been truly engaging for me. And these common themes that continued rising to the surface was I was learning, some, learning something new. Right? I was gaining new insights, expanding my mind in some way, and I was growing in some way. As the journey progressed, I felt like I was progressively becoming a better person than the person I was before. So Facebook, what do you reckon? Is there much of this going on on Facebook? Are you learning when you're on Facebook, really? Are you growing when you're on Facebook, really? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. And I reckon if we're going to create truly engaging communities, then we want to focus on giving people the opportunity to learn and to grow. And if that was the only thing you took out of this presentation, right? Like I invite you even now, just with a notepad and pen in front of you, to if you think about the community that you're leading and the people that you're leading, what's something that you could help them learn tomorrow, right? And what is some journey of personal growth that you could help them along starting right now? What could that be? What could you help them learn right now? And how could you help them grow starting right now? And if only if that was all you needed to, to kick off an idea that got you started, I reckon that would be perfect. So uh, I've recently written a book called Tribe of Learning. And uh, if you find this presentation useful and engaging, uh, I would love to send you a copy of that. And we'll talk about that at the end. And, and, uh, and it'll be on the, the community page for Vid21. I think learning is the central engine which drives uh, engagement. I think learning and growth together, uh, and, and those two feel deeply intertwined to me as concepts. I think it's hard to grow without learning. And I think it's hard to learn without growing. Uh, and so I think of that as the engine that drives engagement. And when I say learning, one of the first things that most people think of in response is, well, there's a learning curve, right? So when you join a new organization or you join a new community, there's a learning curve, yeah? And I think the idea of a learning curve is inherently limiting. And it's this idea, the idea of a learning curve that I wanna break with you today and invite you to think about learning in a new way. So I don't know if we've ever uh, sat down and scientifically agreed on what the learning curve looks like, but I reckon it looks something like this. That is when you start in a new organization or in a new community, you know nothing, right? And you're way down in the bottom corner here. You, you, you haven't spent any time there, but you haven't done anything either, right? So you're, you're at zero, zero on the X, Y plot. And then early days, whoa, this learning curve is steep, right? As every moment goes by in a new job or a new community, you are learning new things rapidly. And then you start to get comfortable, you're making progress, things are going well. And of course, what happens? Well, it starts to taper off a little. And eventually what happens when we, when we follow the learning curve is we reach the dotted line. And the dotted line is an asymptote, if you want to be nerdy about it. But what that really means is a point beyond which we never really progress. And if we're talking about attracting the right people and retaining the right people, introducing a point 
beyond which we never really progress is anathema to progress. I think the learning curve is fundamentally broken in most communities and most organizations because we assume what we need to do is get someone up to speed and then let them work it out. And that is a failure on our part. The learning curve is not enough because there's a point beyond which progression ends. And I want to break that idea and I want to replace the learning curve with a learning loop. Um, I play the drums. I've played the drums since I was eight years old. I remember I was coming home from football training one day and our dad had a drum kit in the back of the car. And this was lucky because I'm a very small human being and, uh, and, and high uh, dangerous physical contact sports like football were not for me. And so my football career was coming to a rapid end at the age of nine or 10. Uh, but fortunately my drumming career was just taking off. Dad picked me up from footy training and he had a drum kit in the back of the car. And I said, oh, dad, whose drums are those? And he said, they're yours. And so began my obsession, my lifelong obsession with rhythms. Uh, and so I'm one of those annoying people whose left hand, right hand, right leg and left leg can all do different things at once. And I can do things like play polyrhythms, right? So I can go. Here are that one's playing a beat. And this one is too. At the same time, my brain can do that with four limbs at once. Anyway, I'm not going to stand here and dance for you, but you get the impression. I'm obsessed with rhythms. Um, and I think humanity has rhythm and cycle built deeply into our souls. You know, the way the earth goes around the sun on an annual basis and the earth spins on its own axis every 24 hours and the moon goes around every 25 hours. And like there are all these different ways in which life is built around these various different rhythms and cycles. And I think that uh, if engagement is central to being a human, right, this idea of learning and growth is central to being a human, then it seems, I don't know, it seems fair enough to me to, to, to search for the rhythms and the cycles that might exist within that process to see if we can unpack and learn a little more about it. And uh, one of my roles in life has been to grow a few different communities. Uh, so a long time ago in a, in a career um, of another, you know, in another land, <laughs> uh, I was actually in go-kart racing and I built a community of 10,000 go-kart racers. And I learned a lot along the way. And I thought that I was talking about go-kart racing, but actually what was going on was I was learning about engagement. And subsequent to that, I got into public speaking and a few other things. And I joined the thought leaders community and ended up uh, becoming the head of engagement for the thought leaders community. And again, it was this process of growing a community and experimenting with things and learning as much as I could about what it is that helps people learn and grow. And I ended up coming to find a, a loop, a cycle, that exists in this learning and growth space, which is, to be honest, a simplification of reality, okay? It doesn't capture everything about reality, but I find it to be an incredibly useful simplification of reality that we can use to design environments, teams, companies, tribes that are as engaging as possible. And what I'd like to do today is just unpack this simple four-step process of learning and growth which I think if you use it as an overlay, as a lens to think about leadership, as a lens to think about how your people are engaging with your team or with your community or with your organization, with your tribe, you might find it a, a useful way to uh, create a tribe that is self-sustaining, where everybody's contributing and where you as the leader no longer have all the responsibility to do absolutely everything. Would that be nice? Would that be helpful? Sounds good. Great. Uh, so if you have a notepad in front of you, feel free to just draw a big circle, which has got four steps around it. And what we're going to do is we're going to fill in the four steps of this learning loop. And guess what phase number one of the learning loop should be? But learning. <laughs> Step one of the learning loop is learning. And I reckon lots of companies and organizations and teams do this really well at the beginning. So when someone comes in, we often have a formal onboarding system set up. You know, we often have a process in place where people are helped along the process of learning whatever it is they need uh, to contribute to the team, at least initially. Um, and learning is incredibly fun. Uh, learning is mind expanding. Uh, learning is, you know, I love that Oliver Wendell Holmes quote. 
uh, a mind uh, that once learns a new idea never retains its original dimensions. A mind stretched by a new idea never retains its original dimensions. And so I think uh, almost everybody loves to learn new things. Uh, and there's a point where we want to go from learning to something else. So um, Megan had mentioned that she's currently doing a graduate diploma of psychology. And I'm sure learning about the psychology of humans is awesome. And Megan, I bet you're super excited about the next step, which is where you get to apply some of that learning and start to put it into practice. So phase two of the learning loop is challenge. It's not enough to just learn something new. We want to actually take that lesson and be challenged in the world with it. Um, where challenge is concerned, I have a, a bunch of friends who, uh, I'm, it seems I'm surrounded in my life by lots and lots of teachers. That wasn't an intentional thing on my part. It just turned out that way. Either there are lots of teachers in the world or I just happen to gravitate to things that teachers are into. But I'm surrounded by loads of teachers. And one of the <laughs> nerdy teaching things that I have learned from my teacher friends is the idea of the zone of proximal development. And so this is like the uh, Goldilocks of, of, uh, of, of putting yourself out there where um, Goldilocks, of course, wanted the porridge that wasn't too hot and wanted too cold, wasn't too cold. When we're being challenged, we want to, uh, we want to take on challenges that are not so difficult that we, uh, you know, it's essentially a Mount Everest that we can't climb. And we also don't want to take on challenges that are so simple that they're trivial. And so there's this idea of the zone of proximal development, which is something that's not too hard, but not too easy. Uh, and we will generally commit ourselves most deeply and find it easiest to commit our discretionary energy towards challenges which fit within that, that band. Um, and of course, we don't want to be stuck in challenge forever. Has anyone ever done something where you, uh, you, you, you took on you know, you took on some challenge and you worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and didn't, you, you weren't making any progress. And at some point, right, it, that's happened to me many times, believe me. At some point, you either need to make progress or like snap out of it and start something new. And so uh, if we end up in a challenge that's either trivially easy and, you know, we don't really get anything out of it, or it's so difficult that we never make progress, uh, then our engagement will be lost. And so step three, of the loop, we're now come from step one learning, step two is challenge, now into step three, down the bottom of the loop, we want to make progress. Progress is critical because I reckon what humans want is fulfillment. Like genuinely at the, at underneath it all, you know, when people go after money, they go after friendships, they go after relationships and everything else. I think what we're truly looking for is I don't know, describe it as well-being, describe it as fulfillment. We're looking for something substantial. And taking on challenges and making progress is one of the key ways that we can experience uh, that most human uh, idea of feeling truly fulfilled by something. And then there's one more step. And I reckon this is the one which particularly in organizations is most commonly missing. I reckon this is the step which for most tribes, if you only allowed me to work on one of the four steps in the learning loop to change the environment, to change the culture, to change the structures, to change the processes, to improve overall engagement, I would work just on this final step. The last step of the learning loop is contribution. I genuinely believe, and call me a lefty, <laughs> I genuinely believe humans are altruistic at heart. At least almost everyone is. I genuinely believe that. And what I've noticed about communities is that where communities uh, where community cultures appear, where people feel uh, not just, where people feel truly able to give and to contribute something back, those are the communities where they remain. If you were to join a community where you took a lot, but weren't able to give anything, I think those, you can, you can find those communities useful for a week or a month or six months or maybe a year. 
But at some point, you just feel like a bit of a drain on everybody else that's there, right? You feel like you're not actually contributing to something. And what people actually want to do, the real source of fulfillment is not the reward they receive when they make progress, but the recognition they receive when they make a contribution back to the group. And I want to make a distinction here. Contribution doesn't mean doing my job, okay? That's often the challenge or the progress is the bit where you're doing your job or you're doing that thing that you're supposed to do in this community. Contribution is a meta-level uh, contribution. So it's where you're contributing back, not the output of your job or your role in the team or whatever it is, but you're actually contributing back to other people in the tribe to other people in the community. So I'll give you an example. And it uses the idea of the master and the apprentice, right? So we're talking tradies. Let's say it's a carpenter. And let's say you've got a master carpenter who's got a team of 10 working underneath them, okay? And there's two or three apprentices, a bunch of qualified carpenters and the master builder. If we wanna create learning loops, deeply engaging loops, Right? Because this is an environment where apprentices quit all the time. They often get started, they do it for a little while, and then they leave. And I think this is one area where someone who wanted to create a truly engaging tribe of carpenters could think about it. What is the, the apprentice's opportunity to contribute back to the group? Okay, so if you think about what an apprentice job is, it's often, you know, go and buy the supplies and drive them back. It's do the basic measuring tasks. It's hold this while someone else is doing the complicated part. Like it's all quite simple. And their job is obviously to learn and grow, learn a bunch of skills, apply them in the challenges they're given and make progress and receive some reward. And how does the apprentice get an opportunity to make the tribe collectively better? When does the apprentice get an opportunity to not just take, not just take knowledge from the qualified carpenters, not just take money from the output of the things that they're building, but actually to contribute something back in. And so it might be that if you've got a number of apprentices, you create a, you know, a Friday, one hour afternoon session where they have an opportunity to contribute back the lessons that they learned throughout the process of the week. So oh, I've realized if you use this saw this particular way, or if you mark it up this particular way, or if you do the measurement in this order, it has this and this and this effect. And that that contribution actually allows the other apprentices to accelerate their learning and their growth because they're learning from that apprentice. And how amazing would it feel? How fulfilling would it feel? How much growth would occur if an apprentice was able to make a contribution, an observation about the work they were doing that fed back up to the master, um, the master builder that owned the whole place and said, hey, I've noticed if we do it this way, it works better. Imagine how they would feel if the master builder said, you're right, after 20 years of doing this, you've found a better way of doing this and that is how we're gonna do this from now on. What do you reckon is gonna make that apprentice feel more valued, Right? What is going to drive them to, to remain in this little tribe of carpenters more? A $1 an hour pay rise or the recognition from the master builder that their opinion and that their observations are important and that they actually have an opportunity not just to take from this tribe, not just take knowledge, take skills and take money and leave behind just you know, the work that they do, but actually to contribute to the tribe and to become one of the leaders. Exactly, it's the feeling of being truly valued, not. And so I invite you to, at the start, I said, hey, what's your tribe? Who are you leading? And I'd love you to think right now, what's one thing that I could do that would give people the opportunity or the prompt, if you like, to contribute just a little bit more? What's one thing you could do to invite people to contribute just a little bit more. Just think of one practical thing, okay? So in the, in the example I've given here, I said that the master builder could have a one hour Friday session where they all sit around with a drink or whatever, and they chat about what have you learned this week? So I'd like you to come up now with just one thing that you could do as the leader, which would create an opportunity for your people to contribute something back to the tribe at large, including you. 
So Wayne's come up with experiential learning. What's another one? I'd love to hear a couple of ideas. What are some things you could do? Julia, you should be thinking here. What, what are the ways that you could get people attending Vid21 to be contributing a little back to this whole experience? Um, whether you want to do this, by the way, for your like commercial tribe, if you like your job or your company, or you want to do it for one of your personal tribes that you're engaged in, either is fine. Okay, so Wayne suggesting 1 p.m. learning theory sessions with the team. Awesome. Um, Wayne, are you willing to unmute yourself and have a chat or are you in a non-chatty environment? Yeah, sure. Go for it. G'day, Wayne. How are you? Welcome. Very good, Cole. Thank you. So, uh, Wayne, just give us a quick uh, idea. Who's your tribe? And tell us what's this idea of the Monday 1 p.m. learning theory session? How do you reckon that could work? Yeah, uh, guilty as charged. It's something we already have in place. Um, we have a, a group uh, that work in a corporate campus, 28 people across Asia Pacific. And as part of the growth uh, within this group, we have a, a regular Monday 1 p.m. session where each person gets to share a new theory related to education or learning. Yeah. Perfect. Love it. That's awesome, Wayne. Thank you. Hey, Sue, uh, hijack team meetings regularly with check my thinking sessions. What's that about? <laughs> Uh, well, with uh, our project delivery, it can get quite um, dry and, right. uh, you know, obviously your tasks are assigned and, uh, to the various different people to deliver uh, and um, we get very, I, I do it, we all do it, we get very stuck in um, our way of doing things. Uh, I had a great example this morning where we were charging down this particular path uh, and the manager who had made the decision said, yes, yes, we need to do it this way. And I called a stop because I said, guys, this is feeling really hard. <laughs> Doesn't need to be this hard. Can we just take a pause and let's do a check-in, shall we? And so yeah. we did. And everyone everyone came in. Uh, it's a safe environment, not a critic, not critiquing anybody. Yeah. And everyone just comes in and contributes. And, and it's questioning and being curious and raising that. Yeah, I think one of the things that you've highlighted there that's absolutely critical, Sue, is uh, the, the leader's primary accountability is to make a space that's safe for people to contribute in. And that if you can create times, places and spaces where people feel um, safe to contribute, like they will be valued, not that every contribution necessarily will be the thing that we do, but at least that it will be heard and considered and potentially acted upon, um, I think that is an amazing um, amazing thing. So here's what I've noticed. We've now got a four-step loop, okay? It goes learning, challenge, progress, contribution. What I have found about the, the, the process of learning and growth is that when someone is able to contribute something back, that's almost like this hitting a reset switch, um, which allows them to let go of that previous part of the journey they've been on and step into the next bit. And without that uh, contribution piece, it often feels like the rest of the journey was wasted in some way. So if you learn something new, you go out in the world and you're challenged by it, you make progress and receive some reward and then nothing, it can feel like a waste. And it, that, that feeling of waste, is a, that is the point of disengagement. And so what we want to do when we're going to create learning loops where it's not just a learning curve where we reach some point and then we never progress beyond it. We need to create these moments of contribution so that we never feel like our efforts to this point have been wasted. The insights we glean, the experience we, 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 we gained has been shared with the group and is now held in the kind of collective consciousness of the tribe that we lead and it hasn't been wasted. And that gives us then the opportunity to step forward and continue to learn something new. I love that, Chris. Yeah, it's vital to celebrate all contributions, um, not to judge them straight away, but to celebrate the contribution for existing at all um, and then use what's useful out of it. Love it. So if the person who you're engaging, right, the person doing the learning and growth is going through this four-step process, they learn something new, they go out in the world and be challenged by it, they make progress and then they contribute something back. That's what they're doing throughout that process. 
And I think that we want to think about as well, what are they receiving at each step of the way along that process? Because we want to make sure if they're going to progress through this loop consistently and continually make progress, then we need to be giving them something along the way. So when they are in phase one, learning, I reckon what they need to be receiving through that process is guidance. And so as the leader or the community supporting these people, we are providing them with constant guidance relevant to the thing that they are learning at the time. And if the only thing that we do in the learning phase for each of our people is know what is relevant to them at the time, that would be an incredible service for us to provide to them. Just know what is that person currently learning? What is the thing they are currently stretching themselves around? And is there any piece of guidance that we could give them at any point that would help them learn that more effectively or more quickly? In the second phase, the challenge phase, what they truly need is encouragement. You've got this. You can do it. And it's occasionally going to look like the resources they need as well, right? But I reckon most humans can do nearly anything just so long as they believe they can. And if we as leaders simply encourage them to step into whatever it is they're doing and do the absolute best they can, I reckon people can do incredible things and they don't need you to hold their hand the whole way. They don't need you to tell them all the steps. They don't need you to essentially do all the work first and have them just fill in the empty boxes. Just encourage them and they will make it happen. In the third phase, progress. What they're doing is progress, but what they need to receive is some kind of reward. Now, of course, rewards can look like financial rewards. You can pay people to work for you. Uh, but rewards equally can look like lots of other things. Um, and I invite you to think about when people make progress in my community, what are the rewards they can receive? Um, there can be rewards that look like Oh, totally, Chris. Yes, Chris is joining in the post-it note game if you haven't, haven't seen it, everybody. Happiness can be a reward, right? Um, there are so many ways that we can reward each other that don't come down to simple, you know, money or physical things. Um, oh, I love that, Julia. So behind reward is respect. Imagine that if every time someone took on a challenge and made progress, what they received was respect from their peers and their tribe. Wouldn't that cause them to want to become a truly um, contributing member of the tribe. And finally, and I think this uh, kind of plays out of that um, same comment, Julia, in the contribution phase, what people truly want is recognition. They want to be recognized for the contribution that they've made. <laughs> I'll answer that question at the end. <laughs> People want to be recognized for the contribution that they've made. And so with this learning loop model, what I think we can do is create journeys for people that don't, that aren't limited by the point beyond which we grow no further. And I think of the learning loop and stay with me here. This metaphor is a little bit weird, but do you remember old school telephones I think most of the people on this call were old enough to know. Remember when you used to pick up the telephone off the thing and, and it was at your parents' house and it had the windy, windy cord, right? Okay, so you know all about the windy cord. All right. So I think of the learning loop as like the windy little cord of an old telephone thing, okay? So there's these tiny little loops and they can last, like each loop around the little telephone cord might be one day, Okay, so in the morning, I would just want to learn something new, just one little thing new. I'd love to learn something and I'd like to put it into practice. You know, it might be, I might be using Excel today and I want to learn how to use VLOOKUP. I'm not convinced anyone in the world knows how to use VLOOKUP, by the way. But anyway, maybe, maybe today I'm using, okay, Julia knows how to use VLOOKUP. All project managers are amazing at it, but I still can't do it. But let's say one morning I'm going to use VLOOKUP, right? And then I want to, put it into a thing. I want to get a little challenge done, right? And then I want to make progress having learned VLOOKUP and get some reward, right? Which is where, I don't know, I make a little bit of, I get make some headway on the project I'm working on. And then finally, I want to have a quick chat with the person next to me about what I, what I learned about VLOOKUP and how it works and on I can go. And so do you understand that's like one little loop that's only one day long, one little learning loop that I've completed. 
and I'm going to stack those together into this telephone cord. And imagine now this telephone cord that's tightly wound, I could wind it around on itself. Remember you used to do that when you're on a long D&M with your friend in year 10 and you'd grab the telephone cord and you'd start to wind it around on itself? And I think of those bigger loops as learning loops as well. And so these might be a week long or a month long or a quarter long, but these are, I'm now learning something more significant. I'm taking on a challenge more significant. I'm gonna make progress and receive a reward, which is more significant. And when I make a contribution back, it's gonna be more significant. And if you imagine now that that big telephone cord thing, we could loop that around on itself. And we might now have learning loops that last years. So I think of your graduate diploma in psychology, for example, as a, as a four year learning loop. You might think of your co career as a psychologist. I'm on my third career. They tend to last about seven years each. I think of each of those as one big long learning loop. So the loop is this huge fractal thing. And if at any point you notice someone getting stuck in that loop and they're no longer making progress, I reckon the only thing you've got to do is find the next smaller loop down and help them make progress around that smaller loop. Even if you're going all the way down to the size of the original telephone cord, where it's just, can I get them around one little learning loop today? Because the energy and the enthusiasm and the momentum that we generate in these smaller loops accumulates and accumulates and accumulates and accumulates and drives us around these bigger loops. So uh, I'd love now, we've got a few minutes. We've shared the learning loop and I'm just interested in if there was like one little insight from it or one little question that you'd like to ask or one like little rabbit hole that you'd like to dive down, um, what would that be? So maybe in the chat box, if there was a rabbit hole opened up by this whole discussion that you would dive down, what is the rabbit hole that you would explore down? And we might, you know, we can have a quick discussion about it, answer a couple of questions, um, talk about a few things. So Jill's asking, is there something about helping people get out of their comfort zone? I totally think there is, Jill. And I think the way that I think about out of their comfort zone through this lens is, I reckon what we want to do is have a large learning loop, a long learning loop that pushes them out of their comfort zone. So you might have something that they're, supposed to achieve over the course of a month or a quarter or a year, which they, which kind of causes them to feel some trepidation. So I think it's totally fine to have things that push us out of our comfort zone over long time periods. And what we want to do is create small learning loops within that, which maybe aren't in our comfort zone, but they're not stretching us so far that we feel overly intimidated by them. So our, our smaller learning loops, our daily and our weekly learning loops are just allowing us to make incremental progress towards this bigger, larger thing. My friend Peter Cook says, uh, people are often disappointed by what we can achieve in a day or a week and amazed by what we can achieve in a year or a decade. Um, and I think that we, there's this calibration thing that the human brain is slightly out of whack. And we always think we should be able to do more in a day. And we're always shocked by, by what we achieve in a year. And so the way that I think about that, particularly around this idea of stretching comfort zones is with learning loops. I want to create long learning loops that are super ambitious because we can be surprised by how much we can achieve in a year or three years. But we want to create that massive progress out of much smaller little learning loops where every day we make a little bit of progress we learn something new we're challenged with it we make a bit of progress we receive a reward and then we give something back to the tribe that we're a part of um additional perspectives wayne around learning as a result of covid do you want to unmute yourself briefly wayne what's your what's your experience been of that like where's that question coming from um i, I guess there's a two-part um, iteration there. One, one is the shift in digital technology um, occurring at a similar time to COVID. So uh, from a learning sphere, uh, we found that there's been a, a huge transition or transformation from classroom-based learning to digital learning. And the speed of that change is somehow um, affecting the dynamics of learning itself. Yeah. Um, 
So I think of culture as, uh, I'll say that again. What habits are to an individual, I think of culture is to a group. So a culture is just what are the things that we habitually do uh, collectively. And one of the things that the COVID year and the technology disruption has done is just change our habits. That is the things that we do collectively, right? So the culture is shifting really quickly. And uh, I reckon the thing that we can do in the same way that when someone's being challenged, I reckon the most valuable thing we can do is give them encouragement. I reckon where the digital divide is, is, um, is concerned or where the changing culture or the changing landscape that we're living in is concerned, the number one thing that we can give people is genuine humanity and genuine empathy. And so I think the opportunity for us to have conversations like this, where I'm talking with people in Shanghai and the USA and New Zealand all at once is an opportunity that I would hate to miss. And of course, it means we can't be in a room and doing this thing uh, together. And so it's on me, I think, as the leader of this little moment to be as human as possible and to be, I don't know, almost unguarded and earnest in my humanity. And I think the thing that breaks the, the problem of digital tools is people choosing and willingly stepping into kind of um, stripping away the, the weirdness we have about interacting with a computer and being as earnestly and unguardedly human as we possibly can, um, because the opportunities that creates uh, are so great that I don't want to lose them. Um, thanks, Wayne. All right, one more. Sue, do you want to bring us home with your question about authentic engagement? Sue finds the mute button. Hello, there we go. Okay, yep, sorry, took me a while. Authentic engagement. What do I mean by that? So um, we said HR box ticking I, exercises, which is something I've seen a few times before. <laughs> yeah. So I go into organisations, and uh, I, you know, I'm a contractor, so I go in independently, and I need to work with what is around me. Uh, and a lot of the time, I'm um, creating these these cultures within my teams, um, but. Uh, have some frustration at some of the restrictions that are around me as far as the organizational culture is concerned. Yeah. And I was looking for ways, you don't shift it by butting up against it. Yeah, totally. I know that, tried that, didn't totally. work. Um, so I was looking for ways, other ways that you can help to shift these leaders, I'll say mindsets, yeah. um, so that you can, uh, create a better learning loop for your teams. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, totally. Um, so I'm, I'm a mathematically minded person and there's this mathematical model that fits almost everything for me. It's the idea of complex adaptive systems. So complex adaptive systems is a, is a, a, a space in mathematics that you can use to describe loads of things. So one example would be say, when birds are flying in a flock, each of them is an individual bird, but together they act as a complex adaptive system. And there's no one bird that decides how the flock moves or goes. It's the, the flock itself is an emergent property of the collective actions of all the individual birds, right? Um, similarly, your brain is a complex adaptive system. There's billions, literally billions of neurons in there. And each of them just gets chemicals in and sends electrical th signals through. And yet your mind, like Sue Danner, is the expression of the emergent property of this incredibly complex interaction. Um, and so I think of you, Sue, as the flock, <laughs> if that makes sense. And there is no flock. You're, this, you're the thing that expresses out of it. And the thing about complex adaptive systems is you can kind of think about them in two ways. You can have um, you know, the biggest bird in the middle, if you like, spreading messages out to the rest of them, trying to tell the rest of the flock what to do. Or you can have all the birds in the flock, each of them doing their own little thing and, and for it to combine together into something great. And I think you need to respond, like if you're going to be truly adaptive, then you need to respond to the situation that you're in. If you're in an environment where the big bird, where you have the big bird's attention and where the big bird does command genuine respect and can influence the actions of the others around them, 
then the fast way to go there might be to go to the big bird and say, hey, why don't we try this and have that that person in an organization, often, you know, someone in a position of authority to make a decision and to say how we're going to do something. And often if you're an external contractor, I think you might uh, find it easier to do it this way. Sometimes the better thing is to sow the seeds down low and let the system itself emerge with it. And what I would often say regards culture change is that it's often easier to change the culture in a, in a team of two or three or four or five or 10 than it is to try and change the culture in a company of 100 or an organization of 1,000 or 10,000. And so what I would do is use the learning loop in really small little groups. You know, you might just have one team leader who really appreciates your work and wants to use what you're doing. And you go, great, let's set up some little learning loops for your five people. And let's make sure they feel like their contributions are being heard and they feel like they're being rewarded for their progress. And what will happen is the energy that builds up in this little group of three or four or five or six will start to leak to the people who are adjacent to them. And they'll say, why is it so good in their office? What's going on over there that's so good? And then what you have is you, you have the flock collectively deciding where you go rather than that one big bird in the middle. So I'd say, can you find the smallest viable group of people who are all willing to commit to this thing truly and authentically and do something great for them? And that will become a magnetic attraction for other people to say, what are they doing right? And how do I get involved? That's how I think about it. Thank you everybody for the questions. It's been an absolute honor to be here with you. Um, I hope that this has been useful. Uh, one final thing before we go, if you'd like a copy of my book, just send an email with the word book in the subject line to col at colfink.com. Um, and if you'd like to chat to me about any of this stuff, send an email to me, cole at colefink.com and just write chat in the subject line. Uh, I will upload a couple of cool things into uh, the space that Julia and the team have set up. Uh, thank you, Julia, for having me. Thank you, everyone, for attending this session. It's been an honor and a joy. Uh, I hope it was really useful. Thanks for watching.